Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barbara Gudeke, and I'm one of the experts on autonomous language learning at the Language Center of the University of Padova. Welcome to the sixth webinar of the nine months, nine universities series, uh, a series of online lectures organized within the framework of Workgroup 11 of the Arcus European University Alliance. The Arcus Alliance brings together nine universities who share academic, scientific and cultural objectives, a common vision of the role of higher education and research and mutual fields of interest. Together, the partner universities are building a novel, inclusive, novel and inclusive approach to education, research and innovation. Workgroup 11 is the plurilingual and intercultural hub and aims to promote plurilingualism and to foster intercultural competences amongst the universities of the Alliance. The webinars of the nine months, nine university series focus on specific topics related to language and culture and target mainly graduate and postgraduate students, as well as early stage researchers and staff interested in those topics. The webinars are intended to generate awareness and appreciation for the topic of multilingualism, as well as an understanding of the many areas of our lives that are related to and influenced by language. Let me now introduce to today's, you to today's speakers from the University of Wroclaw. Hanna Kijerska defended her PhD dissertation on the processing of foreign accent speech at the University of Wroclaw. She then worked as a postdoctoral researcher at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, where she used the event-related brain potentials method to investigate phonetic contrast perception by multilingual speakers. Hannah's main research interests include psycho and neurolinguistics, as well as multilingual language processing. Shishtof Vaj works as an associate professor at the University of Roslav. He's also a postdoctoral researcher at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznania, and his main research areas involve syntax, semantics, Syntax Semantics Interface, Mental Lexicon, Corpus Linguistics, Digital Humanities, Phonetics and Phonology, and Syntax from the Theoretical Perspective. Kishtof wrote his PhD dissertation on the processing of compound words and the organization of the mental lexicon. He is also associated with Roscraft University of Science and Technology in the Klein Consortium. The title of the webinar Hannah and Chistov are going to deliver today is The Perception of Foreign Accented Speech in Multilinguals, The Influence of Grammaticality, Extemporaneity and Learning Setting. The aim of the experiment on which their presentation is based was to investigate the perceived strength of accent and comprehensibility in second and third languages and the ability to identify the speaker's native language in speech samples, as well as to explore the effects of second and third language proficiency levels on the perception of the foreign accent, the comprehensibility and the correlations between these parameters. Before I hand over the screen to Hannah and Christoph, I would just like to remind those of you who are attending the webinar in real time to write their questions in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we are going to have we are going to have time for Hannah and Christoph to answer the upcoming questions. And now, Hannah and Christoph, uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise with the ACUS community. And the screen is yours. Thank you so much for this introduction and uh, for having us uh, here today. Um, so, as already announced, um, uh, the topic for this presentation will concern the perception of a foreign accented speech in multilingual population. Um, so um, what um, I would also like to emphasize is that the uh, one, one of the authors of the current study is Professor Magdalena Bremble from um, Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, and we'll discuss the influence of various um, factors on uh, the perception of um, accentedness in L2 English and L3 Norwegian. So first, a few words of um, an introduction. So uh, first of all, mm, of course, the, the perception of non-native accents is uh, really 
vital issue from uh, both um, social linguistic and psycholinguistic uh, perspective, and it has been thoroughly explored from various uh, research angles. By foreign accentedness, um, here we actually mean the perceived strength of a foreign accent, which of course might be affected by various factors, both listener and speaker oriented, such as um, the level of proficiency, the age of acquisition, uh, say the um, experience with uh, processing foreign accents and many others. And um, several studies so far have focused on research on foreign accentedness, but typically in terms of uh, only one non-native language, be it either this, the first foreign language of the participants, so the so-called L2, or the third or next foreign language, L3, OLN. So the novelty of our contribution mostly lies in uh, the investigation of two non-native languages, but in the same group of speakers, in the same population. And hopefully this, this will enable us to shed more light on the issue of L3 slash LN perception uh, in, in general. So today we'll report the results of foreign accentedness ratings uh, studies accompanied by um, comprehensibility uh, judgment results. And more specifically, we focused on L1 Polish, L2 English, L3 Norwegian speakers. Why is that? So the project was uh, supported by or conducted, um, the, the, the study was conducted within the project um, titled Across Domain Investigations in Multilingualism, ADIM, uh, which was supported by Norway Grants and the National Science Center in Poland. And um, of course, you are more than welcome to also have a look at our project website. And uh, together with, uh, thanks to the collaboration with, with our Norwegian partners, it was uh, possible to obtain data both from instructed learners in um, Poznan, Poland, and from naturalistic learners, migrants to Norway in Trumso, um, Norway, the northern Norway. So, as I, I have already uh, mentioned briefly, FAS technique was used to investigate accentedness in various populations, including bilingual, multilingual, heritage speakers, uh, but not necessarily two languages within the same population. And in terms of um, the, the, the um, methodological considerations of FAR technique, um, it's typically performed on six or nine point Likert scale, and typically includes as the most vital component uh, questions of um, concerning foreign accent strength in, in uh, the speaker. However, very often this question is accompanied by um, questions about comprehensibility, intelligibility, irritate, irritability, confidence, professional, professionalism, uh, friendliness and, and several other factors. And um, for the sake of um, our research, we selected short samples obtained through tasks involving a picture story narration, as well as text reading. What is also crucial, we included a native um, proportion of native control in the overall material. So looking at this, phenomenon from a more uh, theoretical perspective. I'm, I'm really sorry, but the slides are not passing. Um, no. No, if you could move. Maybe full screen would work. I think it is full screen. <laughs> How about now? Maybe I will try again. Mm. How about now? Not yet. Not yet. Mm. 
And now <laughs> I started from the beginning. No, I can't see slides. Yes. Um, maybe you can leave and come back. You mean stop sharing the screen? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe again, um, I will also share a screen. Um, oh, now? Yes. I guess it's working. Perfect. Yeah, Thank can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so maybe I will start where where I stopped. So I think, um, yeah, for, for um, um, in terms of foreign accentedness and speech samples, and then the crucial question, right, asked from, from the point of view of uh, free acquisition, um, is the influence on the previous languages, which of course are the native language, right, L1 and L2 on the acquisition of L3. And the seminal uh, studies um, within the um, area of uh, free acquisition, so here I mean most of the studies conducted by Hammerberg, Hammerberg and, and colleagues, show uh, the influence of the second language, especially at the initial stages of L3 acquisition. And these results were further supplemented, uh, for example, by the results provided by um, Vrembo, who uh, showed the influence of both L1 and L2 on um, L3, in this case, L3 English in their phonology. However, what uh, she also demonstrated is um, the um, issue of proficiency and how greatly it affects um, the um, acquisition of L3. More specifically, um, the, the more advanced the participants were, um, the more often they were correctly identified, associated with their L1 as well. And this uh, phenomenon uh, might be attributed to the so-called foreign language effects, effect, which mm, in this case assumes the reliance, the greater reliance on L2 at the beginning of uh, L3 acquisition, which is of course sometimes viewed as a coping strategy that um, surpasses the L1 transfer. So within our study, we um, focused on several factors um, which um, we expected to um, influence the results and we tried to quite carefully control for them. So um, at first, um, for, oh, the first of, of such factors is um, at the speech mode, right? So whether um, it's read or spontaneous, extemporaneous, a spontaneously produced speech. Uh, so differences were observed between these two uh, these two modes um, mostly attributed to increased uh, self-monitoring and also a bit lower um, level of anxiety in the red tasks, which um, of course influences uh, the level of accentedness. Um, at the same time, um, grammaticality also influences um, perceived accentedness. So in general, lower accentedness ratings were obtained for grammatically correct when compared with grammatically incorrect samples. However, what should be noted as well is uh, that native speakers are sometimes assumed to display reduced sensitivity to these grammatical violations which are associated with foreign accented speech. So here it was really difficult for us to formulate uh, some clear cut predictions concerning grammaticality. We, were ne we nevertheless included this as one, one of the uh, factors controlled uh, in our study. And finally, and here um, this is very much open to debate, however, we also decided to distinguish between formal and immersive learners, as I've already um, said. And in general, no um, specific predictions could be made concerning the differences between these two groups due to the lack of uh, studies which would explicitly compare these, these two groups. However, uh, what should be emphasized at this point is that the naturalistic setting is typically viewed as more uh, beneficial due to the possibility of, of um, holistic immersion in the culture and language of the target country. 
Okay, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, as my colleague has already outlined, no investigation so far has explored two non-native languages in the same group of speakers. And this is exactly what we aimed at in the present study, and this is our contribution. So what we did was a thorough overview of the literature on studies that investigated foreign accented speech, and we decided to test the following variables. Speech mode, that is read versus spontaneous, or extemporaneous, so this basically means improvised. And to give you a slightly broader picture, um, these were based on um, mostly on picture description, so that the speaker saw a cartoon with a number of pictures, and they were to retell a story based on those pictures. But for some speakers, we chose the free rendition based on a question about uh, how they spent their last holiday. Uh, when it comes to grammaticality, we wanted to test whether um, speech samples that contained a grammatical error would be perceived as more accented than those which were grammatically correct. So intuitively, it seems that the presence of grammatical mistakes will affect uh, accent strength and perhaps also comprehensibility. And the last variable uh, is learning setting. And by formal, we mean speakers who learned English and Norwegian in a classroom environment. They attended formal education with this respect. And by naturalistic, we mean Polish migrants to Norway who learned Norwegian. And also they honed the English, by the way, because they used um, English and Norwegian on a daily basis. So grammatical errors can contribute to the perception of a stronger foreign accent because they may reflect patterns of speech that are characteristic of speakers from a particular linguistic background. And grammatic, grammatical errors can also hinder comprehensibility. When listeners encounter grammatical mistakes, they may need to expand more cognitive effort and cognitive workload to understand uh, the speaker's intended meaning. But it's very important to note that the impact of grammatical errors on a perception and comprehensibility can vary depending on several factors, such as proficiency of the speaker, such as familiarity of the listener with the speaker's um, dialect and accents, so broadly speaking by speakers L1, so the, the origin. And additionally, some listeners may be more tolerant of grammatical errors. So that's quite important to have a number of listeners to be able to later on generalize the results. And when delivering a red speech, speakers may have a chance and may have more control over the pronunciation and intonation. Um, in extemporaneous speech, in more spontaneous speech, uh, speakers may be less focused on pronunciation as such, but may be more focused on conveying the message quickly, naturally, and this can lead to a more noticeable foreign accent as speakers may not have the opportunity to carefully monitor the speech for pronunciation and intonation accuracy. So spontaneous speech can influence um, authenticity, fluency, and uh, as a result, this, these may positively influence the comprehensibility, despite the presence of a foreign accent. And when individuals acquire foreign accent through language instruction uh, or formal learning setting, their pronunciation and speech patterns may reflect influence of the instructors or the instructional materials. But on the other hand, in a more naturalistic acquisition, through immersion, through interaction with native speakers, the accent tends to develop more naturally, reflecting the phonetic and prosodic patterns of native speakers. So instruction-induced um, um, accents may be characterized by more obvious deviations from native-like pronunciation, while naturalistic accents may um, show greater degree of variation depending on factors such as individuals, language learning, background, exposure. So we had three rating parameters in our study, accent strength, comprehensibility, L1 identification, and we posed three research questions. 
Will the presence of grammatical errors affect the perceived strength of a foreign accent? Um, and comprehensibility? Will the speech mode read versus extemporaneous affect the perceived strength of foreign accent and comprehensibility? And will the instruction induced foreign accent in L3 speakers influence the perception of foreign accent and comprehensibility compared to naturalistic speakers? And in order to answer these research questions, uh, we designed a FAR study, so foreign accent rating study, in which we recorded a speech from 20 adult L1 Polish speakers with L2 English and L3 or LN Norwegian, 10 of whom were naturalistic and the other 10 instructed. And for raters, we needed native speakers because they have this intuitive understanding of the pronunciation patterns, intonation and rhythm that characterize the language. And this enables native speakers to see those small, subtle nuisances and deviations in pronunciation and they may, that may not be apparent to non-native speakers. So we basically played those English samples from our Polish L2 English speakers to 50 English native speakers. And similarly, we played the Norwegian samples from our Polish L3 Norwegian speakers, by the way, the same speakers as L2 English, to 50 Norwegian natives. And it needs to be highlighted though that these were the same Polish speakers in both English and Norwegian blocks. Now a bit more about our speakers. So in the naturalistic group, we had 10 Polish migrants who reside in Norway. They were recorded in Tromsø. That's northern Norway. We can see this very nice picture here of Norway. It's, Tromsø is uh, high up there in Norway. Actually, it's uh, north of the Arctic Circle. Um, so they were 36 year old on average. Their English proficiency was higher than Norwegian proficiency. As so we can see, 6.0 zero as compared to 4.6 and they stayed for over seven years in Norway. In the instructed group we invited 10 Polish students of Scandinavian studies who were recorded in Szczecin and Polsing, that's Poland, and unfortunately they were younger on average than the naturalistic group. We can see 21.6 as compared to 36, over 36, but Whoever has ever recorded participants with such a multilingual profile and a number of, number of other requirements, prerequisites, essential for the study knows that it would take so much time and energy that essentially their cake's not worth the candle. Fortunately, though, their English and Norwegian proficiency were very similar to the natu naturalistic group. And again, fortunately, they spent almost no time in Norway, which only confirms that they, they acquired Norwegian practically 100% in an instructed setting. Now, slightly more about our native raters. So for English, they, were, they came mostly from Great Britain, some also from the United States and Australia, and they were recruited solely via the prolific platform. And as a curiosity, I must say that it took us less than an hour to recruit them. It was very fast. Uh, but for Norwegian, the easiness of recruitment was far from that, because they came, um, not only did they come from across Norway, uh, but they needed to be recruited via prolific, and also via otherwise established contacts. It took us somewhat close to three months to recruit them and countless emails were sent, flyers advertising the, scatter, uh, the study scattered across uh, different public areas in Norway by our Norwegian friends, recruitment posters. It was really difficult to find them. Uh, when it comes to our experimental material, we selected speech samples from around seven to ten seconds long and that was based on previous literature and given this previous literature um, we found out that this is the optimal time for listeners to be able to already recognize the accent 
but with the whole experiment not being too long, um, so that the fatigue effect would not intervene. And the speech samples came both from English and Norwegian, and in both languages we had red speech, which was only grammatically correct, and extemporaneous speech, but this time it was either error-free or, or erroneous. And we can see a number of technical details given below, but let me just say that the necessary precautions were taken to maximize the audibility of speech samples, such as, for instance, um, the same volume for all speech samples throughout the experiment. I've already talked about conditions uh, when I was presenting the study, but I think now when we have this general picture of what the study looks like more, and when this all these um, have been outlined, it's good to have the conditions neatly formulated in one place. So we selected speech samples based on four different conditions, uh, language status, L2 English versus L3 or LN Norwegian, speaking mode, that's read versus extemporaneous, acquisition setting, naturalistic versus instructed, and grammaticality, error-free versus erroneous. And it's, it needs to be highlighted here as well that that was only in the case of extemporaneous speech, the grammaticality condition. All samples uh, with grammaticality errors were uh, had uh, those four different criteria, that's a wrong word order, the use of a deviant inflectional or derivational affix, the use of a deviant selection of syntactic or morphosyntactic category, and a missing article. And it's also quite important that all samples were verified by proficient speakers of English and Norwegian correspondingly, to make sure that the error-free samples were indeed error-free and those that contained grammatical errors included those errors. Um, and the samples, all the samples included two or three grammatical errors, but at least they had one. Mm -hmm. uh, so now let us listen to the samples from our random naturalistic speaker. They agreed that the one who first succeeded in making the tra traveler uh, take his cloak off should be considered stronger than the, uh, the other. So the, the boy saw it and uh, just ran towards him to, to help him to get out of the bush. So there is a cat who observes a butterfly that sits on a bush Okay, uh, so please mind that the red font, for example, in observe, indicates places with grammatical errors. And for the Norwegian samples, we can see that the translation is given below, but that's given only for extemporaneous, error-free, and extemporaneous, erroneous speech, not for the red one. And that is because the sentence is actually identical to the one in the English red speech sample, uh, because they read the same text, uh, in both English and Norwegian, that text came from the North Wind and the Sun, and the sentence for the red speech in Norwegian is they agreed that the one who first succeeded, and so on. Let us now listen to the Norwegian samples. Also, that comes in good. Some have pulls a hun looper etter musen, or musen yemesai yetre. They agreed that the one who first succeeded in making the tra traveler uh, take his cloak off should be considered stronger than the, uh, the so other. The, the boy so there is a cat uh, also so, lie on uh, the... so now the same for a random instructed speaker you can just that the one first succeeded in making the traveler take his cloak off should be considered stronger than the other the boy surprised with the cat lost his red ball and it 
got stuck in the sea. During this time, Cat see a species that he, of course, loves to eat. Die blij en hier om alsen vers te kunnen vermoeden die ota af zijn trakken stullen jelle voor vers te keren en dan andere. Hem hem ze pluser of hem elsker pluser, zo hem spitser mangja dan een is ko die kreeg of een git zo dan alsen. So all in all, the English block consisted of 80 speech samples, 60 of them were target samples, and 20 came from control groups to have a reference point, 10 from native English speakers, and 10 from native, uh, non, actually non-native uh, English speakers, but uh, other than Polish. And the uh, Norwegian block, had 76 speech samples altogether. Um, again, 60 from our target groups, naturalistic and instructed. Uh, but this time, just 16 speech samples came from our control groups. And as you can see, the number of native non-Polish speakers differed. Well, it, it was difficult to find other speakers than Polish who knew English and Norwegian, and even more important, it was not essential to have the same number of non-natives in both parts, in both, both blocks. Um, and to make it a little bit easier for you to visualize the procedure, what the procedure looked like, here's the chart that shows the subsequent stages with one within one trial. And so each trial began with listening to a speech sample. The samples could be played several times by our native raters, and it was only the raters decision to proceed to the questions. So the first question was about perceived accentedness. The raters saw a question that went, how much of a foreign accent does the speaker have? And they were to press an appropriate number that corresponded to the scale. One meant uh, no foreign accent and nine meant a very strong foreign accent. Now, the second question tested comprehensibility. The raters saw the question, how comprehensible is the speech sample to you? And again, they were to rate it on a Likert scale, where one meant non-comprehensible at all, and nine, very comprehensible. And the last question was about, it, it's not visible, but it was about the origin of the speaker. So it was an open question. What do you think is the speaker's first language, L1, for which the raters needed to provide an answer without any prompted options? And the procedure was identical for English and Norwegian. And as mentioned earlier, it was executed, executed online via a survey on Qualtrics. It was preceded by a background questionnaire to have a profile of who our raters were. And the speech samples were pseudo-randomized to avoid the occurrence of the same speaker in 10 consecutive samples. And this was done to minimize the chances of recognizing a previously heard speaker. And now it's back to Hannah. Thank you. So a few words about the statistical analysis. So of course, having obtained all the data, we analyzed them. In this case, with the aid of our software. And more specifically, we um, fitted four identical linear mixed effect models um, for ordinal response variables, as this was the type of um, the variable we obtained, uh, separately for English and Norwegian, separately for accentedness and comprehensibility, hence uh, four, uh, four models. Mm, so as fixed effects, we included condition and uh, by condition, uh, we mean uh, whether the sentence, the sample was read, uh, extemporaneous correct or extemporaneous incorrect. And the other fixed effect was setting, so whether the speaker uh, was a formal or a naturalistic learner of uh, L2 English, L3 Norwegian. And in addition to account for a variability among our participants, we also included 
included a random effect, um, so intercepts for participants and uh, items. Then in order to assess the statistical significance of, of uh, the um, effects in question, we uh, conducted likelihood ratio tests, so more specifically uh, to assess whether there is a statistically significant interaction effect, we compared a model containing the interaction to a model with two main effects. And um, if necessary, we also conducted, uh, we also compared the model with the two main effects uh, against the model without the main effect uh, in question. So for example, uh, setting or condition. And finally, again, if necessary, we conducted pairwise comparisons uh, in order to see which uh, specific conditions differed. So now, um, analyzing them y by one by y by, by one by one. So first, uh, in terms of uh, accentedness, uh, we can see there was a statistically significant main effect of condition, and more concretely there was a difference between correct as opposed to incorrect sentences with the former ones um, uh, assessed as uh, less accented. However, in Norwegian, um, no statistically significant main effects or interactions or even trends were observed. So there is a difference between languages with, with this respect. Then in terms of uh, comprehensibility, we can see um, even more statistically significant effects were obtained. So apart from the main effect of condition, we also observed a statistically significant main effect of setting with uh, instructed learners perceived as significantly less comprehensible when compared with naturalistic learners. And in addition, we had this really nice gradual effect of condition with uh, red sentences unsurprisingly judged as most comprehensible uh, than correct uh, sentences and um, finally incorrect sentences as least comprehensible. So all, um, all three pairs, um, the differences between all three uh, condition pairs uh, reach the level of statistical significance. And the general pattern looks uh, quite similar in L3 and Norwegian. So um, there was also a statistically significant main effect of setting. And once again, uh, naturalistic learners were perceived as more comprehensible than instructed learners. And uh, there were differences in terms of condition. Um, however, the only two significant um, Contrast, so statistically significant contrasts were between red as opposed to incorrect and between correct as opposed to incorrect speech. So we did not find any significant statistically significant difference between red speech and spontaneously produced correct sentences in L3 Norwegian, unlike in L2 English. All right, so as could be seen from a statistical analysis, perceived accentedness was affected by grammatical correctness. Uh, so grammatical errors um, in the so, so grammatical speech, which was correct, so error-free versus erroneous, and error-free speech uh, was perceived as less accented than erroneous speech. What is important, that was only found in the case of L2 English. And we had a number of possible explanations why this happened. First of all, speakers' level of proficiency, higher sensitivity of their raters, and in many cases, mixed learning environments. And in accordance with recent evidence from behavioral and neurophysiological studies, native speakers reduced sensitivity to grammatical violations. In typically moderately to heavily accented, non-native speech when compared with native speech. And in L2 English, a language at which our participants were generally rather advanced, grammatical errors seemed to serve as an additional cue, influencing writers' judgments about global accentedness. So, so coming back to our research questions, will the presence of grammatical errors affect the perceived accentedness? Yes, in L2. Will the speech mode, so red versus extemporaneous, affect the perceived accentedness? No. 
Will the instruction induced foreign accent in L3 LN speakers influence the perceived accentedness compared to naturalistic speakers? No. And when it comes to perceived comprehensibility, we can see that it was affected by grammatical correctness, uh, but both in L2 English and L3 Norwegian. And again, extemporaneous correct speech was perceived as more comprehensible than the one that contained grammatical errors. Also, it was affected by speech mode this time, but only in the case of L2 English. Why? Mainly, again, influenced by the level of proficiency or rater's experience with foreign accents, because um, native speakers of English are more um, exposed to English, which is uh, spoken by non-natives, than Norwegians who listen to Norwegian spoken by non-natives. Um, additionally, uh, comprehensibility was affected by learning setting, and this happened both in English and Norwegian. Uh, 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 sorry, yes, in English, L2 English, and L3 Norwegian. And naturalistic speech was more comprehensible than formal. So, more holistically speaking, everyday immersion in the language and culture of the target country um, helped uh, our raters or, or uh, uh, cause our writers to be more comprehensive. So coming back to our research questions, will the presence of grammatical errors affect the perceived comprehensibility? Yes, in both uh, L2 English, L3 Norwegian. Will the speech mode read versus extemporaneous affect perceived comprehensibility? Yes, but only uh, in L2 English. And will the instruction induced foreign accent in L3 speakers influence the comprehensibility compared to naturalistic speakers? Yes, again, in both. And now, correlations uh, between accentedness and comprehensibility for L2 and L3. So we found a strong negative correlation between the level of perceived accentedness and comprehensibility for, for L2, but also for L3, uh, which means that the more accented the speakers were in general, the less comprehensible they were as well. And in addition, we found a moderate positive correlation which was observed between comprehensibility ratings in L2 English and in L3 Norwegian. So basically the degree of comprehensibility in English correlated with the degree of comprehensibility in Norwegian. In other words, a speaker who was more comprehensible in English was also more comprehensible in Norwegian. And we have also looked at individual differences between speakers. So from a broader perspective, the observed patterns for most speakers, showed that high ratings in L2 English were accompanied by high ratings in L3 Norwegian. However, we have found several exceptions. Um, those were our speakers who were a bit different than the rest of the group. Uh, they were called this. They are the so-called outliers, and we believe that these deviations were caused by either linguistic or extra-linguistic biographical factors, such, a, such as, for example, a longer stay in Norway as compared to the rest of the group. For one speaker, it was 12 years. Or in other uh, case, it was a partner who was a native Norwegian speaker. So again, this might have been the factor that influenced the result, this deviation from the group. Thank you very much. Sorry, we can't hear you. Now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. No, I was just saying thank you very much because that was really, really interesting. Um, let me just have a look if there are questions coming from the listeners. Okay. At the moment, as there aren't, there are no other questions on the chat. Uh, I've got the chance to ask mine. I think one of my, my first question was one which was related to the 
second last slide, basically, because I was thinking about uh, the impact of the educational sofa, social profiles of your participants and how they may have or might have affected the results of your study. Um, yeah, that was something I was interested in. Yes, yes. Uh, so for sure, <laughs> they, they might have affected the results. So as um, mentioned uh, by Krzysztof while he was presenting, um, there were quite uh, important differences between the two groups who were investigating mm -hmm. in terms of age, but also education level, as you pointed out. So um, typically the, the formal learners um, were students at Adam Mickiewicz University or the University of Szczecin, and they were, of course, uh, younger than uh, the naturalistic learners who were migrants to Norway, coming from um, yeah, various backgrounds and also various uh, professions, various mm -hmm. levels of education. So unfortunately, it was um, not feasible for us to find uh, perfectly balanced groups in, in this respect, as it was difficult to recruit students, uh, for example, in uh, Norway, it was easier to recruit um, yeah, adults. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, of course, yeah, that, that there, there are some differences to a certain degree, unavoidable, uh, but still um, should be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also the, the last, maybe on the second last slide, the part about the bi biographical uh, characteristics. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I wouldn't have thought about those while I was listening before and then it uh, uh it was highlighted in the in the presentation and um why did you choose that something i i'm not 100 percent sure i understand properly why did you choose the same sentence for all speakers in the read condition which was more clear but why didn't you um why did you choose different sentences uh in the correct extemporaneous speech and erroneous Temp extemporaneous speech, yeah, I think that was it. Okay, if I may, I can tackle this question. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, well, it would be difficult or almost impossible to select the same sentence in the extemporaneous speech for both error-free condition and the the uh, erroneous condition because the, uh, the speech samples were improvised. Basically, uh, our speakers told a story based on a picture or, or a cut on a cartoon or they were asked the question how they spent their holiday in norway and uh, they created their own uh, their own rendition uh, so what we did we annotated the text uh, we transcribed it and we annotated tagged the the grammatical errors and uh, basically we selected a sentence that contained errors and that was long approximately seven up to 10 seconds long so okay. that the, the speech samples throughout the experiment would be equally uh, long. When it comes to read sentences, everyone read uh, a short text. That was the text in uh, both in English and Norwegian, the North Wind and the Sun. And we chose the sentence with the fewest errors and again across the board. So this text is actually a standard text used in many phonetic uh, tasks. Um, and besides what uh, was not mentioned, we needed also this text for, for a speech corpus and for other, uh, other tasks, uh, for other experiments. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, I just realized that there were upcoming questions from the chat. Uh... So um have to read them right now in real time. Therefore, maybe you have partially already answered them. So how was the extemporaneous speech collected? Is the question from Cassine. Cassine uh, Gakle. Yeah. It seems that I have just answered this yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. And were these speech samples long enough? Yes, you have answered that as well before, just right now. Uh, yeah, but I may add something to this because um, this comment is is uh, is actually very nice because it might seem on the basis of the speech samples that we have presented that the red samples were longer, uh, but they were longer visually actually because yeah. red speech 
um, doesn't have the number of hesitations. It's difficult to omit all the hesitations and the pauses. And that's why visually it might seem that they were longer. However, we tried to have all um, the samples uh, equally long, around seven to 10 seconds long. Sometimes it was impossible, sometimes it was six, sometimes it was 11, but in general, uh, I think that it was enough for the raters to already be able to recognize the the accents. So that was what we what we wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that was a, a complete answer to Kerstin's question, but she has another one and she asks you what are some general recommendations for language learning that you would make based on your study? A very general um, recommendation. <laughs> Well, so um, partly, but perhaps not completely, I, I believe our study shows um, certain advantages of a naturalistic mode of uh, acquisition, right? The, the immersive learners were perceived as more comprehensible, though, um, to be honest, not necessarily um, less accented, right, than instructed learners. So one one thing which, which we might uh, perhaps... Um, highlight with this respect is that uh, it's always beneficial to interact uh, with native speakers, right? Um, and that um, immersion as a learning strategy has uh, certainly its, its own merits. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess I have time for a very last question. Um, so what I would find very um, uh, exciting would be also if, uh, do you think your results could be generalized with respect to language status? Like if one tested other languages than English uh, or Norwegian as language two or second language and third language, could, if I would try the same thing with Italian and, mm, Italian and Norwegian, would you think I could expect similar similar results uh, if I obviously if I manage to get a, a group of students of the same level of because I ha I know that it's quite difficult uh, and a big part of your job was also to 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 find the right uh, group of participants obviously which for other languages. Uh, right now doesn't come to my mind but i'm would you think i could use the same uh, or could i expect the same results if i try to change languages uh, to have another lang a group of language two and language speak three speakers well it is a challenging question a tricky one thank you but a very nice one thank you so much for it so um in my opinion, I, I actually believe that it wouldn't be the case because there is a number of factors that contribute to, to um, uh, how the, the speaker is perceived in terms of accent and dance comprehensibility um, and actually um, how similar these languages are to each other. Because, for instance, if you were to study L1, Polish, L2 Italian, L3 Russians, the raters, ratings would be perhaps uh, higher uh, or, or lower uh, if we were to, for instance, uh, have speakers of L1 Polish, L2, let's say Ukraine, L3 Russian, and the uh, linguistic proximity or language proximity would be much higher then we would expect that would translate into different results. And I think the, the different, uh, different uh, perception of how they uh, sound in, in non-native speech because of, for instance, a similar repertoire of phones between the languages. Um, there wouldn't be so many deviations in the phonetic inventories mm -hmm. of, of, of these languages. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
thanks for the question. Kerstin says thank you as well. I don't know if you see her. <laughs> because thank all you her so questions. much for, for those questions. Very nice questions. And thank you, Barbara, for your questions as well. No, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, yeah, I'm really impressed, as always. <laughs> like, because uh, I, yeah, I, I was, I think it's a really, really interesting research and uh, knowledge to gain from from research and yeah thanks 